Uh, good morning, um, and thank you very much for the, for the opportunity to speak today. It's a, a real privilege just to be here. I, I really actually wanted to carry on from where Philip um, left off to talk about London's programmes for reducing carbon emissions, but really in the context of the broader proposition that cities are the place where the battle to prevent catastrophic climate change will be won or lost. That's not really a very radical statement given half of humanity live in cities and we're responsible for something like three quarters of, of global energy consumption. Um, but certainly it was this proposition, this, this vision that London, the former Mayor of London, Ken Livingston, set out um, to demonstrate and really Ken Livingston made tackling climate change the um, defining feature of his administration in his second term and attempted to integrate climate change policy into the wider vision for developing the city, compelled not by uh, electoral um, pressure or really government compulsion, but instead by ecological um, and, and scientific reality. Um, and looking at the program that, that London developed over the last um, eight years, this was codified um, in a document that, that Philip referred to, the London Climate Change Action Plan, published in 2007, which set out very ambitious targets to reduce carbon emissions in London, 60% by 2025, 80% by 2050. These are targets that the national government in the UK has now adopted, but at the time they were about double those of the UK's um, national targets, and derived from uh, what scientists told us was necessary uh, if London was to play its part in reducing um, global emissions. They are targets that were set for the city as a whole, not just the function of the municipal government, the covering the whole population of 7.6 uh, million people. And the programme started from analysis of London's current carbon footprint set out on the, the pie chart in the middle of the screen there. Uh, and Philip's already pointed out that this excludes aviation. If we'd included aviation in there, it would be the single biggest component. But putting that to one side, actually energy use by Londoners in their homes is the biggest contributor in London, 38% of emissions, 33% from the commercial and public sector, a smaller proportion, 7% from industry, and 22% from transport, relatively low because of the preponderance of public transport use um, in the city. And what we then attempted to do was to work through concrete programs to reduce emissions 60% in each of those sectors which the, the, the pie charts round the edge of the screen um, set out. And I won't go through all of them because there's nowhere near enough time, but just to pick on, on two or three. And starting with transport, because A, because that is the area where the mayor in London has the greatest powers and the greatest budget, almost two thirds of his total budget, but also because sustainable transport really underpins uh, any opportunity for developing a low carbon city, but also because it was a transport policy, the congestion charge, the policy of charging drivers eight pounds a day, 10 or 11 dollars to drive into the center of London. The success of that policy that was really the catalyst for developing a more radical environmental and climate change program in London. And the core of, of, the, of the green transport program was to improve the physical infrastructure of public transport in the city. 35%, you can see on that sort of donut chart, 35% of the estimated emissions reduction within the Climate Change Action Plan came from a huge 13 billion pounds uh, investment program concentrated initially on the bus system because that's the quickest and most efficient way to increase uh, public transport provision and where we achieved a 40% increase in bus passengers over a period of four or five years but also with significant increased investment in the softer transport modes, particularly cycling, where there's been an 80% increase in cycling in the city, albeit from a low base. And with the, the combination of those policies has enabled London to achieve a 5% shift away from private car transport to public transport primarily, but also cycling and walking in the city, relatively unprecedented for a city of London scale. And while there were, mo there were the primary motivation in the Climate Change Action Plan is obviously reducing carbon emissions. There are multiple benefits of this sort of approach, including big reductions in the number of people killed on London's roads, down 35%, major improvements in air quality um, and noise also. And indeed, the primary motivation for the congestion charge initially was to tackle congestion, which was a major electoral issue, not, not as an environmental measure. 
Moving on to the, the emissions in the commercial uh, and public sector, an area where the mayor has significantly less powers than in the transport um, arena and where the majority of emissions come from energy use um, in buildings, half of which are still going to be standing in 2050, still going to be in use in 2050, the point by which we're told we have to reduce emissions by 80%. And therefore our programme focused very much on what we could do to change the way those buildings are used and change uh, the, 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 the physical nature of those buildings with a major uh, building retrofit programme which has only really just got underway um, and was derived from uh, interaction with other cities in the C40. Um, and this, this programme, we've offered up uh, 40 major buildings in London, including police and fire stations, as well as large office buildings, to the private sector to ask them to come forward with proposals to reduce emissions 25% over a seven or eight year period, but with the private sector putting up the investment to make those changes, which will then be paid for out of the financial savings that the city gains through um, the energy savings. And I think, interestingly, in the current economic climate, this is a policy that the new Mayor of London, someone without a tremendous track record on the environment, has chosen to keep because of the significant financial benefits to the city, a saving of £1 million a year estimated for those initial buildings alone, um, as well as the environmental savings. The, but the whole of, whole of London's climate change approach relies ultimately on changing the way that energy is supplied and distributed in the city, an area where the mayor has no formal powers whatsoever, no control uh, formally over the um, energy utilities, and also where there's incredible inherent waste in the system. The national grid and power supply system in the United Kingdom wastes two-thirds of the energy that it, it creates in the form of lost heat, and therefore there are huge opportunities for improved efficiencies, but in London at least, very limited opportunities for moving to large-scale renewable energy generation because of the density um, of the, the in built infrastructure in the city. London's plans therefore focus very much on moving to a more decentralized energy supply, focusing on combined heat power and cooling systems, and, and moving towards uh, using energy um, from waste with a target of moving a quarter of all of London's energy supply to be produced within the boundaries of the city by 2025. A hugely ambitious target, but one which is thought to be possible through the use of the Mayor's planning powers over new developments, but also using the uh, Economic Development Agency, which has set up an energy services company of its own to, to catalyse the market for decentralised energy. But Look, looking now as a, an outside observer on, on London government, I think actually the most interesting thing about London's climate change programme is the fact that all of its policies were underpinned by a conscious effort to seek out best practice internationally and learn from it and copy it in London. And that ultimately ended up with the establishment of a group of cities called the C40, the 40 of the largest cities in the world, working together and competing um, to tackle climate change and really accepting that whilst we rely on national and international legislation and regulation to implement many of our policies in our cities, there's a huge amount that we can do together, but also that to some extent we can, as big cities working together, we can force the national agenda to move uh, more quickly and there's no need to wait for international intervention. And so to conclude, thinking about where next um, for, for cities as we move into what one might term the ecological age, moving from the carbon age to the ecological age. I take a, a very positive uh, view, much the, the, the same as, as set out by Philip of the role that cities can play. And perhaps to pick up on the, the comment made by uh, David Satherwaite in the Urban Age newspaper produced for this conference, I don't think that to say that the battle to prevent catastrophic climate change will be won or lost in cities is to put the blame on cities. On the contrary, I think that, that, that it's to take a very positive view that identifying that, that urban living provides a, the potential for sustainable ecological age models of living. Not to say that that's easy. If one looks at the latest uh, views from the, the Tyndall Climate Change Centre in the UK, we have to emissions, global emissions have to peak 
in 2015 and then reduced 6 to 8 percent year on year from 2020 through to 2050. That is an extraordinary task that has never been achieved uh, previously um, in history. But, and I'll, I'll conclude with this, taking um, a statement often repeated by my former boss, Ken Livingstone, the Mayor of London, we don't have to reduce our quality of life to tackle climate change, but we do have to change the way that we live. And there are now attractive visions, the, the image on the slide is that of the proposed Dongtan Eco City, attractive visions of how we can build new cities that will fit the paradigm of the ecological age. But the real challenge is to work out how we can reprogram and retrofit the cities that we already inhabit. Thank you very much.